So I think it's good to sort of clarify how fusion usually generates energy, where this intermediate step of heating up water, then the steam is the thing that leads to electricity. And then, of course, the FRC method that you use leads directly to electricity. I was wondering if you could describe sort of the difference between those two. Yeah, I, I like the analogy of the match and the campfire. And I hear that a lot in fusion, where um, a lot of what steady fusion, think a Stellarator or Tokamak, is attempting to do is take a little bit of fuel, that match, and then add heat um, to ignite that match. And then put it with enough fuel and in the right conditions and hold on to it for a long time that it grows into a campfire. Even if you're doing, if they do a good job, a bonfire, it's creating mm -hmm. a tremendous amount of, of energy in that steady system, burning fuel in the same place, generating some ash, generating a lot of heat in that reaction. Um, and in, and in a traditional, in a, in a, in a tokamak or a stellarator, that's a lot of what you're doing is you're, you're holding on to the heat as much as possible to keep that reaction going. Um, and in that, the, the optimal fuel is called deuterium and tritium, where you have deuterium is a heavy isotope of hydrogen where you have an extra neutron. And tritium is a very rare form of hydrogen um, that's an unstable form. It's, it's so rare, it's hard to get, where it has two neutrons and a proton. And when you fuse those together at high, very high temperatures, uh, at, at very at very high densities or high enough densities and very high temperatures, um, they make helium, which is a charged particle, which stays inside the campfire, mm -hmm. inside the tokamak, um, continuing to heat it and stoke the flames. And it makes a neutron, which leaves mm -hmm. the system because it's uncharged. It has no charge. And in that system, it's actually ideal. It's really great because in a campfire, you have this reaction going and you want to get the energy out of it. You want to use it. And you don't want to just burn up all the fuel and do nothing. That's not really valuable. What's really valuable is to stand next to the campfire and get the heat, get what comes off of it. Mm -hmm. um, and then use that in a, in a traditional fusion system to boil water, to heat the water, and then at 30, 35% efficiency, then convert that through a steam turbine into a cooling tower and cool off the fuel and extract electricity. Mm -hmm. And we know steam turbines, coal plants do this, um, nuclear fission reactors do this. Um, and so we know how to do that. And, and, and that's the traditional way of doing it. But what I think there's other ways to do it with a pulsed magnetic system, there's a, one more thing you get to do. Because you have this high beta where there's an electric field and an electromagnetic force that's now compressing the fusion fuel, it's increasing in temperature, it's getting hotter, it's increasing in temperature, density fusion is happening, new fusion particles are being born, and those particles are not just stoking the flame, they're not just holding on the campfire like in the tokamak, but they're doing another thing, which is really powerful, which is they're pushing back on the magnetic field. Mm -hmm. They're applying a pressure. That pressure induces a current. We can extract that electrical current. Mm -hmm. But then, but it takes you into another direction. So your analogy of the, the campfire now breaks down because now the campfire is expanding. It's pushing back on something. And so now it's the analogy of the piston engine. Mm -hmm. As you move from the match, the campfire, to now pistons. And so you use in a piston engine, you use the motion of the piston, the pressure on it and the motion of it to do something useful. And in, in a piston engine, it's to turn a crankshaft and, 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 and uh, run uh, a, turn a crankshaft and run wheels, or maybe even a piston engine to turn a crankshaft and run a generator and make electricity. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you can do it pretty high efficiency in a, a generator using that method, um, using the expansion of that piston. And what we do is use the expansion of the magnetic field to extract that electricity. And we believe you can do it much, much higher efficiencies. In fact, um, there's been theoretical papers that show not 30 to 35% efficiency like a steam turbine can do, but 80% efficiency, 85% efficiency, extract much more of the energy of the fuel in that process. Can you actually just take a tiny tangent? Mm -hmm. On the word efficiency here. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so so you said 30%. So it's inefficient. And that efficiency measure is how much of the energy is actually converted to electricity? 
that measure is how much of the thermal energy that gets outside of the system is then converted into electricity, which is mm -hmm. the thing we care about. We want, yeah. we're, we're not in this to, to make fusion. We're in this to make electricity mm -hmm. and we're using fusion to make electricity. And so from, from my point of view, that should be the focus is how do we get to that? So that's the efficiency of that thermal energy that makes it out to electricity. What it is not a measure of how much energy you put into the system and what happens to that. Um, in terms of you started this campfire with a blowtorch, what about all that blowtorch energy? What are you getting for that? And so I think that's something that high beta is one more side benefit that it turns out is actually maybe the tail that wags the dog is that not only do you at high efficiency get out any of the new fusion energy, which is great because that's what you want, make electricity from fusion, but you also get to recover all of that magnetic energy you put back into it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the really powerful one. And that's something that um, folks have demonstrated over 95% efficiency, that you can put electricity into fusion and then get that electricity back out and 95% efficiency plus some very high efficiency, maybe 80%, maybe higher of all the fusion product electricity too. So now you're just ma making a tremendous amount of electricity in one of these systems. Um, and that has all kinds of performance and engineering benefits that are really powerful, but it also pushes you to other fuels. Mm -hmm. So we talked about how deuterium and tritium fuels make this neutron, which mm -hmm. leaves the system to boil water, to run steam turbines, but it doesn't push back on the magnetic field so in one of these high beta systems, it's actually not a great fuel at all. And so the other fuels that are out there are even more interesting. And one of the candidate fuels that's really interesting is called deuterium and helium-3. Mm -hmm. Now we talked about deuterium, heavy, heavy hydrogen. Well, helium-3, uh, the nucleus is also called a helion. That's why we named the company that, mm -hmm. uh, is light helium, which is in normal helium, which is what you find in a balloon, it's two protons to neutrons. It's very stable um, uh, and found, found, found commonly. Um, helium-3 is also stable, um, but it's not found commonly. Fortunately, it's lightweight, so it, it leaves. It literally leaves the atmosphere and goes into space. Um, so we don't have a lot of it here on Earth, uh, and so you have to make it, or you have to go into space. And there's a whole other thing about how do, where do you get it? Do you get it from the moon? Jupiter has, it turns out, massive amounts of helium-3. And so, but when you take deuterium and helium-3 and you fuse those together, you also get that helium particle, that alpha particle that we call that in fusion. But instead of the neutron, you get a proton. And that proton is a charged particle. It's a helium a hydrogen nucleus. That proton is now trapped in the magnetic field, pushes back, and you can extract that electricity. Now, there's some prices to be paid for this helium-3 fuel. But for a high beta system like uh, a pulsed magnetic fusion system, that's really the ideal fuel. When you say prices, uh, where, what is the, yeah, is there like technical costs or what, what, what are the prices? What shape do the prices take? <laughs> All kinds of shapes, um, a physics and engineering, a technical and a business cost. Okay. Um, and so let's, let's dive in. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> great, um, great. So, yeah, so we talked about how helium three is, so from the fusion physics point of view, we talked about a hundred million degrees. That's the temperature that deuterium and tritium fusion works really well. And that's the temperature that traditional fusion folks have really focused on getting to. That's the threshold of when you get to 100 million degrees, you're at the operating point of fusion and you know it works, um, colloquially anyway. Um, helium-3 requires higher temperatures. That's not enough. Yes, fusion happens for helium, deuterium and helium-3 at 100 million degrees, but it's not its optimal temperature. And in fact, in a high beta system, the optimal temperature is higher 200, even sometimes 300 million degrees. So you have to get to even higher temperatures. Temperature's hard. And so you have to push to even higher temperatures than you had before. And so that's, that's one of the downsides. Um, the other downside can be as you get to those higher temperatures, we talked about B squared is NT. B squared is density times temperature. Well, for a given magnetic field, density and temperature are now inverse. So as I increase temperature, density decreases. And so now you have a, an issue of you may have less particles to do fusion, which means your fusion system has to get bigger than it was before. Mm -hmm. So for the same reaction rates, a helium-3 system compared to deuterium tritium has to operate at a higher temperature and be bigger. However, the flip side is 
is if you can now recover energy at 80, at three times the energy efficiency, 30 at 80 some percent versus 30 some percent and recover all your input energy, then now it's actually about the same size mm -hmm. because for the same electricity output, not energy, it's not energy that we're worried about. It's electricity we're worried about. Electricity output, now you can actually build systems of similar size and similar energy only they're now at this much higher efficiency. Got it. What can you say more about size? What are we talking about here? Like what? Why is size a, a, an important constraint? And that gets to one of the other price. That gets to money. So, yeah. our goal is we want to build clean, low cost electricity and get it out in the world. But that means it needs to be low cost. Mm -hmm. That's fundamental. If it's really expensive, no one's going to buy it. And uh, while it can be clean, it's not going to be deployed. And so that is always has to be a part and uh, of why what the promise of fusion is that can be low cost. Um, so how do we know how much fusion systems cost? It's a really great question. Uh, and a lot of it comes down to fundamental size that you have to just build things. And so there's some really first principles, cost engineering you can do around power plants for fundamentally, what do they cost? How much concrete went into it? Fundamentally, how big is it? Um, and that, and that if you're doing a good job of manufacturing, the, you are, your goal is to manufacture a product for as low of cost as you can. So you can sell it for as, for as low price as you can. It asymptotes to the material cost because you never get uh, cheaper than that. So it's literally in some sense, some sort of first principle sense is how much concrete how, it how, goes into, into building the power plant. How much concrete, how much concrete, how much steel, how much um, copper and aluminum, different materials cost different amount, but at the end of the day, the cheapest function is the least amount of materials. Wow. Okay. And, and so that's, we think a lot about that and how we can make these systems smaller so they can be developed at lower cost. Now there's a flip side. You still need to produce electricity. Mm -hmm. So if you make them really small and they don't produce electricity and there is some minimum size to fusion, and that's really important. Fusion scientists and engineers don't see you'd ever have a, uh, fusion generator on the back of your DeLorean, for instance. The physics doesn't let that one happen. At least physics is as we've understood for the last uh, you know, 100 or 200 years. 